this is leadership style. And basically, five steps to transforming our community. This is how Jesus transformed the world. And, and when Jesus transformed the world, He didn't just transform it for His day. He, he's still transforming it 2,000 years later through the power of His Holy Spirit. And, and I, I'm always constantly amazed about how often we will do the best we can to understand what Jesus taught and obey it. But we've, I think we've thrown His methodology right out the window. How did Jesus train 12 guys to change their world and then become a movement of billions over 2,000 years? Let us take a look at it. All right, Jesus led the most effective movement in the history of the world. We've established that. How did He do it, and can it be duplicated today? There are five steps to transforming community. This was in your material this last week. Um, step number one, Jesus told His disciples to follow Me. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus said, Come, follow me. Literally, leave where you are and come with me. That's what he said to his disciples. Uh, and right here, I think, is where the modern day version of discipleship training starts to fall apart. Uh, I, this is just my story. It may not be your story. But my story is, is that I walked down an aisle at the age of seven... And I became a Christian. I really believe I did. There are years I thought I didn't. There are years I thought, no, I didn't. There, there's no way a seven-year-old can really make that kind of decision. And I, and, uh, and I found myself uh, with a temptation to try to nail it down several times that I really was a Christian. But I look back at it, and, and I really believe I was. The problem with me, from the time that I was actually baptized, which is the age of nine, from the time I was baptized until my late 20s, I never had a mentor. I never had anyone to walk with me and show me the spiritual ropes. The time that I did have one was when I was in counseling for the childhood abuse I had as a child. And I've, I've kind of told that story a little bit to you in the past. But it wasn't until my late 20s that, that I, was, I actually was mentored by a gentleman. His name was Dr. Lewis Gregory. And uh, I'm going to get Lewis out here one day. He's a fascinating guy. And, and it was for four years that Lewis walked with me. And, and God did a tremendous healing job in my heart and my life. But since that time, I kind of got dumped back out and, 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 and hadn't had a mentor again until I moved to Idaho and I met Ron Wiesemeyer. But, but Ron, Ron is, a, is the next thing I had to a mentor when I moved up here along. And I have to give kudos to, to Jim Masters and I have to give kudos also to Eric Redmond. And, and, and it, it's been really neat to have these three guys on my board because they all could be anywhere from an uncle to a father to me. And, and they're not afraid to tell me, Gary, that's a good idea, but no. <laughs> and, you know, and there's been many a times where Ron has been there to counsel me and help me and, and to be there for me in the last five to six years. But I really believe that we have, we, we, we dropped the ball right here on step one with the follow me. Now, this is the reason why I think it's next week in your material that I'm encouraging you to find a yoke fellow. A yoke fellow is different than a mentor. A yoke fellow is someone you're yoked together with that you can walk through life and faith in Christ together with. Matter of fact, to help you facilitate that, I am starting two groups. One group will be a day group, a morning group, and the other group will be an evening group. What that's designed to do is this designed for those of you that would like to enter in the, that type of relationship to where there's a little accountability. There's a little reporting to be done. There's a little something to kind of give you some encouragement. You can either get in a morning group or an evening group. And because we all need, Lewis told me this way. He said, Gary, in all of our lives, God 
needs a face. And that all of us need a mentor or our yoke fellow. We all need someone to grow with, to help us. And you say, well, I'm married. Well, that's good. But guys, you need another guy. Ladies, you need another lady that you can also become yoked together with. And there's an interesting aspect to this. Leave where you are and live with me. I find that a lot of people want to go with Christ. They just don't want to leave where they are. You can't do both. A lot of us are trying to squeeze Christ into our already busy schedule. If you will, if you want to be practical that way about it. And next week in your material, I go through a lot of that. About how are you trying to ask Christ... Do you say, God, I love you, if you'll do it this way? Are you, are you saying, God, I love you, and I'm putting, I'm just shoving, shoving it all on the table, and I'm letting you rearrange, take out, put in, whatever you need? What's your way? But it all starts with follow me. Now, step two is watch me. Now, the disciples observed Jesus as he demonstrated what it looks like when God works through someone. Look at that statement. The disciples observed Jesus as he demonstrated what it looks like when God works through someone. Jesus didn't do it the way we do it. He didn't invite the guys in on a Friday night or a Sunday morning and line out the steps for knowing God's will and said, okay, go, find God's will. He said, watch me. When you see how I do it, that's how you are going to do it. So they watched it. Now, that in Mark 4, Jesus is telling a parable of the soils. Then after he did that, that evening they did step three. They had a debriefing. A debrief is an intimate time of more teaching and talking. Jesus had a debriefing with his disciples, I would imagine, almost every day. And, and some of the most powerful things in the Bible that you read came out of their debriefing sessions. And that's where they learned a lot. Let's go to step four. Practice runs. You see, Jesus eventually sent the disciples into the world and they had, spe they had specific assignments. And then they would return and report. Now, a big time that that happened was in Luke 10, verses 1 through 24. He sent 72 out. They went out, and he gave them specific instructions about what to do, where to go, what to bring, what not to bring, what happens if they don't receive you, what happens if they do receive you. And I want you to understand here, he gave the disciples the kind of instructions that we would give a preschooler. He left nothing to chance about what those guys might experience. And oh, by the way, he didn't ever send them out by themselves either. He always sent them out with somebody. Now, I am, and I preach it too, you know, the, it's in these verses where Jesus says that the fields are white unto harvest. Send out. Pray that the, the, harvest, the harvester, the great God, will send out harvesters into the fields. And boy, we preachers get up there and preach that to motivate the sheep to get out there and go get them. But there's another verse before that that we hardly ever hear. Oh, did we tell you there's wolves out there? And be careful because those wolves will kill sheep. I'm always amazed how we send our little children off on the little cheese wagons. That's what we used to call the buses. Oh, you've had your hour of youth group. You've had your hour of church. Listen to the old man preach to you. Go get him, boy. Go win him to Jesus. <laughs> and we wonder why we're losing so many of our Christian kids. We're sending them out as sheep among wolves. Yeah, the field's white to harvest. But I think you need to ex 
send an experienced harvester out there, not a child. And even Jesus would not send the guys out with less than two, and these were grown men. We need some practice runs. We need, we need to, you know, now they're going without Jesus, but with somebody. Step five is launch. After three years of intense training, of living and moving with Jesus, the disciples are ready to launch out on their own. Jesus can now return to the Father. This is John 17 where Jesus was praying his high priestly prayer, as many call it. And he says, God, you gave them to me. I've trained them up. They're ready to go. I can come home. For the whole mission, the reason why Jesus spent three years on earth, you ever wondered why that? Why did Jesus need three years on earth? Surely he knew what was going on, and he couldn't he grown up to be a man, get baptized by John the Baptist, and go crawl on the cross? Why didn't he need three years? Well, you see, Jesus came to equip these guys to start a movement after he was gone. So he had to do it right. He had to do it effectively. He had to do it where when he left, it would not flop. And that was his strategy right here. Follow me. Watch me. Debrief. Go on practice runs. And launch. And the disciples couldn't fake getting it. It wasn't a Sunday morning service. It wasn't a weekend retreat. It wasn't a summer camp. It wasn't taking two weeks off and trying to find God. It was three years of training. Of completely reorienting their lives. I want you to think about these guys. Think about these guys. In just three to four years... They went from God the Father being over them and sacrificing, which their families had done for thousands of years. They went from God over us to God with us, seeing Jesus and God in the flesh for three years, to seeing the Holy Spirit come down in Acts to God in us. They went from God over us, God with us, to God in us. And their whole lives made a dramatic change. Imagine what it would have been like to live during those times. And to be put through those type of dramatic changes. Folks, I really do believe that we are going to have to learn to do church a different way. I really do believe we're going to have to learn to do Christianity a different way. I really do believe we need to redefine believe. We need to redefine trust. We need to redefine discipleship. We need to redefine follow me. We need to redefine it not into something new, but we need to redefine it in the context in our lives back to what the scriptural meanings are. And I truly believe in the depths of my soul that when we do, God will bring a spiritual awakening to this community. Just like he did with them. It'll be bigger. It'll be more dramatic. The miracles will be more intense. The spiritual aspect of what God will do will be seen by all. It might be as dramatic as the fire falling on Sinai. You see, we don't believe that God moves that way anymore. How did that happen? You know, we're wanting to make it through the week, and God's wanting to heal your sickness. We're wanting to, to somehow keep my family together, and, and, and God is wanting to do a miracle through your life, and He's wanting to see you go out and, and perform miracles in other people's lives. We're struggling just to make it, and God's saying, come on, man, trust me. 
I, w- I was sharing Christ today with a person. And, and it was kind of interesting, the conversation. Every conversation I have with someone about coming to Christ is, is different. But the conversation I was having today, the best way I could describe it to you in just a short, short few minutes we have left before we go to our small groups, is there is a gap, if you will, in between where you are and where God is. And in that little gap, I call it the trust zone. You, it, it's where you intellectually adhere to all the things that you're hearing about Jesus and you can grasp it. Then you get to the edge and it's kind of like Indiana Jones. You know what I'm talking about with the Holy Grail? The, what is it called? The Last Crusade? Does anybody remember what happened? He, he's, he has to go across the chasm, but there's nothing there. But there is, isn't there? There's a bridge there, but you, he, he, but you, and he knows the bridge is there. He's, you know, he's, he's Indiana Jones. He studied his book. But he doesn't want to take the step because you can't see it. Listen, listen, listen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Coming to Christ is a leap of faith. It's stepping where you can't see the ground. It's moving when you can't tell where you're going. It's driving with the fog right here. And knowing, spiritually speaking, and knowing that you're going to be okay because You've let go of the steering wheel and Christ is steering or you're making the step and you know even if you fall, he's going to catch you. And I took that person today right up to the precipice of the, of the cliff, right to the edge. And they looked at me and they said, I don't know if I can do that. And I said, you know what? Thank you for your honesty, but just know this. Every time you walk away from the ledge, coming back is harder, and you may not get that chance again. I try to help the person understand that walking away from the ledge of faith can be more dangerous than taking the leap. But there's something about, that might be my sinful past, and that might be what's killing me, but at least I know what it looks like. Getting to that edge where I know, I believe that's where the answer is, but I've never stepped off before. Look. I said that using salvation and a conversation I had with a person today, but we're on the edge of the same precipice of the same canyon, only the canyon that, the, that, that, that we're standing on the edge of is the canyon of we've always done it that way. This is the only way I know how to do Jesus. This is the only way I know how to do Holy Spirit. This is the only way I know how to do church. This is the only way I know how to seek God. And God say, I believe to us there's a better way. And this is it. How can Jesus' model be implemented? How, how do we discover that? I mean, do we all quit our jobs and just go right, buy 200 acres and go up, up here north of town? Don't say that too much. I might do that. You know, I made, I made that suggestion on Facebook today and Lizanne just jumped all over it. You know, let's walk together and let God show us. Do you want to go on an adventure? Are you tired of life as the way it is and you're ready for an adventure? Let's go on an adventure together. What does it look like? You know, Let's have lunch. Let's, let's visit with one another. 
you know, let's share thoughts online. Let's just trust God and trust each other enough that we can be just a little bit of, what's the word? We can be vulnerable. We can have, we, we, can, we can just dare to step outside our boxes and let God do something new in our lives. That's what the next two months are about. That's what they're about. Uh, are you interested in a deeper yoke fellow relationship with people? We're starting two groups. One will meet weekly during the day and the other during the evening. Uh, the group will do more networking locally and nationally. We're gonna, gonna challenge the group a little bit more. And, and I am doing a reality video series and that group will serve as some of the main stars. Now, you may not want to and that's fine. But I've got, are you ready for this? I'm starting to get quite a crowd on Facebook that's starting to, that have joined the I Am a Christian American group. And I've got 32 people already signed up, subscribed to the, to the YouTube page where these videos are going to go up. And that what I want people to see is I want people to see us shout and struggle. I want, to see, I want them to see us slipping and getting it. I want the world to have a bird's eye view into what God is doing here. And, 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 we're, and I, I'm just, you know, God is just calling us, I think, to this.